and we're going to see as we look at Esther incredible highs and incredible lows. Uh, Israel is captive in Persia, but then the opportunity to go back to Israel is there. And then someone's going to give a word that comes and they're all depressed and just up and down all over. And we're talking Mother's Day and there can be a lot of emotion out there and things going on. And I understand that, so there's no way I'm tackling this topic without my wife being here. So Jenny, man, it's good to have you here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, it's true what he said. Mother's Day can be a wonderful day, except it can also be a difficult day. Um, there are many women probably sitting right here, single women, maybe you had wanted to be married, wanted to bear children, physical children, but that wasn't in God's plan for you. You're spiritual moms, but not physical moms. And that can bring some, some concerns sometimes. Um, there are women who have struggled with in who have struggled or who struggle right now with maybe infertility issues. And around you, you see everybody being becoming pregnant or, you know moms with multiple children, and, and part of you, you're so happy for them. You want to be happy. You know in your heart you're supposed to rejoice with those who rejoice, but there's still an ache inside, and only Jesus can understand that ache. There's women who have lost children either due to miscarriage or even the death of an older child. Um, this day can bring a lot of emotion with it, trigger a lot of emotions that only Jesus can heal in his way and in his time. And the loss of a child forever changes a person. There are women who might be here who are estranged from children, maybe children of prodigals, children who aren't living the way that you had always hoped and planned, and, and right now it's, it's very hard. You're, they're, they grieve you in how they're living. Or you witness the unhappiness of a child who's maybe in an abusive or unhealthy relationship. And, or mothers that grieve for children who maybe want a relationship and aren't there yet. There's a saying that says, a mother is only as happy as her unhappiest child. Now, there is some truth in that. And this can be a sad day for those of us who've lost their mothers. I personally lost my mom when I was only 23 years old. Um, some of you have lost mothers earlier than that. Some of you have maybe had a mother been blessed living longer, but it's been a recent loss. And that loss can feel like a lo the loss of a very best friend sometimes. Or sometimes it can feel like a grieving that it was a strained relationship. And some of us are here that maybe have moms that we just never really had that intimate closeness, that emotional closeness that we always wanted. And that is a grieving for, in a sense, what never was. And, th and then um, some of us, mothers, grandmothers, um, ourselves, Maybe there's an older parent that is maybe has dementia or an illness, and you're seeing the aging and the process of that. And that can be a very hard emotional time as well. It's in a way you're becoming, you're a mom or maybe a grandma yourself, but you're also becoming a mom to your mom. And then lastly, there's a lot of regrets, I think, on this day. A lot of failures, maybe people perceive failures. Oh, I would have, wish I could have done that better. Um, they say there's kind of a joke about grandparents. It's like a second chance to correct all the mistakes you made with your own children. That's why grandparents are so great. Um, but truly, there is a, such an awesome thing. I actually read it in the devotional Jesus Calling. It was on May 9th, and ironically, that was the date of my mom's birthday. Had she lived, she'd be 82 today. But it said, it talked about failures and regrets and mistakes. Um, you know, and I think Kim's mom was here a couple of years ago, and she said, sometimes, you know, we always feel we, we, we wallow in these regrets and mistakes, but if we didn't make those, there'd be other regrets and mistakes we'd have. But Jesus Calling said, God can bring good even out of our mistakes. Because we're human, we're going to continue to make mistakes. And to think that you can be in this error-free, mistake-free life, that's actually symptomatic of pride. Because our failures can be a source of blessing. It can actually humble us and give us more empathy and more um, compassion for those around us who are struggling in areas of weakness themselves. And we need to minister to others out of our failures. And I think for women, this is a hard thing. And maybe that's one of the things that 
you know, we talk about mentoring and things like that, and maybe it's difficult for some of us because we think, well, I didn't do so good at that, so how can I mentor somebody else? But actually, you would probably be the greatest mentor to a person to minister from an honest heart out of the failures of the past. Yeah, so it can seem like, wow, what a great way to start a sermon, all these failures. But people were talking about the emotions. Uh, my wife and I were talking with a mother uh, not that long ago who's their mother moved back in with them because of a situation, and then their 30-year-old daughter moved back in with them because of a situation. So here we have this mother dealing with, how do you deal with a mother that used to take care of you, now you're taking care of them, and then a child that was out for a long time, and they're there, and you can imagine the squeeze from both sides that's going on with that. And the, the, people, this is just real life. Yeah. And so what we're trying to share with you is navigating this, and we don't want to give you a coping mechanism. The Bible speaks really clearly on this, and we have a key point that we must learn to encourage yourself in the Lord. We really do. It's a necessity for someone that's a follower of the Lord to learn how to encourage ourselves, and where we get that is 1 Samuel chapter 30, and it's talking about a man named David. David is not king. He's been anointed to be king of Israel, but for the last 10 years, he was promised that, and Saul is standing in his way. How would you like that, first off, that you have a promise, and this person's the only person stopping you from fulfilling that promise? How many would have an issue with that person? And you'd be like at war, and then that person's trying to kill you your whole life. And this is what God's working through David. Well, for 10 years he's running. He's got about 600 men that have surrounded him. He's no longer running for his life. At this time, there's a time of peace that's come into his life. He's living in a town called Ziklag. Him and his 600 men and their families are living there. It's in the land of the Philistines. There is a king over the Philistines, Achish. But Achish, the king, literally said to David, you're like an angel of God to me. How many think that's a compliment for a king to say that? One king's trying to kill you, and another king says you're like an angel of God. Where's your heart going to go? You know, where's it going to lean here? So he's leaning that direction. Uh, he's at peace. He's over a city. He's got 600 followers. It's not what he was prophesied to happen, but after 10 years, how many know we start to settle? Maybe I heard them wrong. This is what I have. I'm over a city, 600 people. The king likes me. And those kind of things start to work out in our lives. And how many know that the stories Jenny was saying can change in a moment. Our life can change in a moment. A text can come, uh, email, uh, phone call, and your life just flips upside down. So David's coming back with his 600 men, and the city's wiped out by a, a raiding party. I mean, it's gone. His family's gone. Everybody's gone. It's not what they expected. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 3. When David and his men saw the ruins and realized what had happened to their families, they wept until they could weep no more. David's two wives were among those captured. Now David was in great danger. Here he had such safety, and now suddenly he's in great danger because his men were very bitter about losing their sons and daughters, and they began to talk of stoning him. Talk about your life flipping. He just heard, you're like an angel of God. David would have said, well, the king thinks I'm like an angel of God. No, we're going to kill you. <laughs> you know, the, the up and down change that happens so fast. But... We talk about this word quite a bit. When the Bible says, but, everything that's said before it is null and void and what's happening now. So everything's gone, but David was able to encourage himself in the Lord, strengthen himself in the Lord. That's why, man, can we learn how to do that? Actually, this whole message was birthed at a conference that you went to, and you came back and were sharing with me, and it just struck a chord mm -hmm. with me. Yeah, I had the privilege of going to a Heidi Baker conference a couple weeks ago. Um, those of you who aren't familiar with Heidi Baker, I think most of us are, she has an incredibly strong calling and anointing on her life. Her and her husband, Roland, have been called to the nation of Mozambique. Um, literally, they gave up pretty much everything um, to answer that call and obedience to God. Uh, Pastor Allison actually had, in, in one of the blogs, if you ever read the blogs online, had a, one of Heidi's stories in there, in her blog. But um, anyway, when they were first called to Mozambique, Heidi, they ministered out of the garbage dump, like literally out of the garbage dump. But God had so, uh, just in Heidi's heart, and she loved that place of ministry, out of a dump. Um, so much so that when the Lord called her to go to the nations, she currently travels 250,000 miles a year internationally 
um, she really didn't want to go. She kind of fought with God a little bit. I don't want to leave this place. Um, so they've been there in the last 24 years. They've truly seen the miraculous in countless ways. There's actually a book called Birthing the Miraculous, some of the details and stories. But if you've heard in the news, um, in the last, I believe, month, there were two cyclones that struck Mozambique, back-to-back -back cyclones that literally devastated the nation. Thousands upon thousands were dead, millions affected by these cyclones. She said that 90% of their second largest city was just flat. Uh, as she walked through what used to be a house, flat buildings, flat. Um, she said she <laughs> was not prepared for what she saw, but God told her, open your eyes. You have to look. You have to see. Um, and she said, I wasn't prepared to see mamas in the mud holding their dead children or dead mamas in the mud, as she said. But again, the Lord told her, Keep your eyes open. Focus on me. You have to see the ones in front of you, Heidi, but you got to keep your focus on me. And if we allow him to open our eyes, he's going to give us the strength to open our hands. She said that every pastor that she knew in that city of Mozambique had lost everything. She said not one of them was sobbing, not one of them. She said they were literally the feet on the ground in that place of tragedy. Now, Heidi herself, 24 years of ministry, building called there by God, her and her husband, a college or a school, um, not even built yet, destroyed, and she's 24 years, God, why? What is going on? Why? And she said all she could pull out of her spirit was encourage yourself in the Lord. And she actually said, I was too tired. I was just too tired. I couldn't even, but she forced herself literally, encourage yourself in the Lord. And she said she began to say, forcing herself to say and believe, God, you're good, even in the midst of the storm, even in the midst of the cyclone, even in the midst of failure and regret, God, you're good. And she encouraged herself in the Lord. And so that's why we made this a key point. People, we've got to learn, because how do you emotionally prepare for what tomorrow might bring? You know, we like to talk to ourselves and, oh, I can deal with anything. We, we don't know. And so we, we've got to learn this practice. Uh, Psalm 34, 3 says, magnify the Lord with me. Now, magnify, we look at the magnifying glass, something small, making it bigger. You cannot make the Lord bigger. It's impossible to make him bigger. So it's not talking about make God bigger, okay? What it's asking us to do is focus on his nearness because it's bigger in nearness. And I guess the best way to define that for you would be if an airplane flies over our head, it looks so small. But when you're at the airport getting on an airplane, how many know they're huge? You know, some have four seats across. Stand to, you know, I've been in international flights with 12 seats across. And the hugest. What's the difference between the plane flying over our head and the one I'm climbing aboard? It's the nearness of it. And so when the Bible says, magnify the Lord with me, focus on his nearness is the challenge. Can we focus on the nearness of the Lord? And that's the challenge David's sitting there saying. Uh, the word, it's uh, actually a Hebrew word for magnify, and the word is hegeomai, hegeomai, okay? That really means two things. How do we magnify the Lord? How do you focus? Hegeomai breaks it down. The first thing that hegeomai means is a ledger. It's a ledger. And what a ledger is, is like a spreadsheet that you have an amount of money, and what you have to do with that money is you have to put it in the proper place. That's how you make a budget. You take this and put it in the proper place, and that's called a ledger. I know a ledger is an older term, but you're just literally putting it in the place where it really belongs. Um, let's face it. We have a much better memory of our failures than we do our accomplishments. You know, God can do a lot of things, and one failure happens, and that's all we remember, okay? It, it's, it's just the way we are. And David, coming back from and seeing Ziklag, it, there's nothing that he did wrong to cause Ziklag to be destroyed. Sometimes we sit there and say, well, if I just didn't sin so much, God would bless me. There's no direct tie to Ziklag being burned and David's sin in his life. Now, we're all sinners, and all problems happen because we're sinners, okay? It, and the only way that's going to stop is when God sets his kingdom up here. But specific problems per specific sin, we, we got to wash that out. We sit there and go, well, if I wouldn't have done that, this wouldn't have happened. And that's not what he's sitting here saying. Uh, but God is using 
this, to refine his faith. How do you put it in a ledger? How do you magnify the Lord? This is a verse we use a lot here, and it's in James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 2. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Now, I don't think David came back, saw his city burning and his family gone, and said, yes, what a great opportunity to be joyful. <laughs> and if you're like that, you should be talking through this mic instead of me, because I'm not there. But it does say, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Okay, that there's something that happens. That is grabbing hold of the thing and putting it in the ledger. That is grabbing hold of the fear, the sorrow, the pain, and putting it in the proper ledger because there's a great joy that can happen. Why is there great joy? It goes on to say, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. People, there's going to be a test against your faith. Because the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. It doesn't say it's hard. It says it's impossible to please God. And so I pray a lot, God, refine my faith. I want to be pleasing to you. You want to please God. The first prayer you got to pray is make my faith strong. Because if I don't have strong faith, it is impossible to please you. So how does that begin to happen? Endurance comes into our lives. When a trial comes, when a test of my faith, it says endurance can come. And look, endurance has a chance to grow. So here we have troubles come. Consider it a great opportunity for when your faith is tested, endurance can grow. And then look at this. So let it grow. Well, how's it going to grow? Check that out. Let it grow. But how does it grow? By your faith being tested. How's your faith being tested? When trials come into your life. And yet he's praying what? Let it grow. And I'm like, oh man, that's a rough prayer. So let it grow. Because when endurance is complete, I am complete, needing nothing. I'm perfect. See why there's an opportunity? Why I can grab hold of these things and say, he geo my. God, you're going to use this to make me perfect and in need of nothing. I can grab hold of this thought and somehow I can put it in the ledger, God, that you're going to do something to develop this that I will need nothing. And then the second word for hegeomai is the way we do that. It has the word authority in it. The word is literally authority, that we take authority over these situations, that we claim them. People, you have the ability to rule over the words that happen in your mouth. And so this is the start of James. It's talking about being perfect, needing nothing. And at the end, it says, talks about what perfect religion is. Mm -hmm. And it relates it to your mouth. And so with that, I think a, a, a huge window into that is the words that we speak. Yes. Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it will eat its fruit. Death and life refers to evil and good, as well as the literal. To love it refers to using it. So whatever way you choose, whatever way you speak, it's going to bear fruit, whether good or evil. There's some very strong teachings on our words from the Torah club, which I didn't tell him I was going to do this, but I want Megan and... Michael and Megan Westfall do an amazing job. Wednesday night, just stand so people can see who you are quick. Uh, and they lead our Torah club Wednesday night. Um, and this study, I'm going to take some of it. It's based on the book of Leviticus um, and the strong words. So the rabbis actually considered biblical leprosy to be primarily a punishment for the evil tongue. Um, Miriam, as you remember, grumbled against Moses and she was struck with leprosy. James 1.26 says that if anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, his religion is worthless. An illustration was picture you have a huge bucket of water and you work all day long to fill this huge cistern with all the water. At the end of the day, you find out the cistern had a hole in it and all the water's gone. That's the same kind of thing. We can study all we want. We can pray all we want. Um, but if we don't control our tongue, we can learn. But if we're not living a life where we control our tongue, everything's been wasted. 
And if we continually allow ourselves, and we live in a world where it's very easy to speak out negative, cynical, critical things. But if we allow ourselves to continually speak those things out, you're going to find yourself in a negative, cynical, evil world. So we need to exercise that authority over our mouth. And I'm telling you, this is not an easy thing. This is one of the hardest things, and I believe it's a continual working. And some of us think we conquer it, and then we find ourselves back again doing it. So um, you can build or destroy with our tongues. You can mend or break. You can tear. You can fix. Um, but the tongue basically can bring the holiness of heaven down to earth. And with that, we can build up and speak positive, see the good in people in situations, or we can continually tear down. And by doing that, we're damaging the kingdom of heaven, but even more importantly, we're damaging our own souls. And it's a really big deal. I think we can brush this over and think we're okay, but we're not. And um, we're going to be talking. There's way too much. The, the Torah Club does an excellent job. It goes so deep into some of this stuff. We're going to be talking more about um, the words as we study Esther in the next few weeks. And I'd encourage you, if you aren't in the Torah Club, that's why we had them stand. Talk to them about it. Because the words that we speak, so powerful. Because if endurance, again, brings us that we need nothing, and then you think your life is perfect, and you don't control your tongue, are you, are you perfect? You know, it, it just collapses in on itself. And so I, going back to David's story, I got to assume, I, I mean, we were just singing a song that said, I will build my life upon your love. I will not be shaken. But then something happens and words come out of our mouth. I, I fail. We are not talking to you like we've accomplished this. I'm not. My <laughs> wife is much better at it. I'm not. Why do you think I invited her up here? <laughs> you know, I, I fall short in this, people. I do, and I say dumb things. We all do. Okay? We, we all do. What? <laughs> Help. <laughs> well, and that's what's, it's so important, too, to seek counsel from godly people. Seek counsel from people that are around you, because that's vital. Romans 15, 4 says also, through the encouragement from scriptures, we're going to have hope. And it's vital in these days, and I think a lot of us are sensing it. It's so important to study the Word of God. And I'm not saying just listen on Sunday, listen on Wednesday. Every day we need to be studying it and getting it in our spirit. Um, and we need to find those scriptures that speak life into us. Uh, now, Satan's not tying God's hands uh, during our trials. He hasn't invaded heaven and made God incompetent but the problem's in our mind. And sometimes we live such uh, defeated lives. It, it's not because of Satan, but it's because we are ignorant of the closeness of Christ in our lives, how close he can be in our lives. I love it that the majority of the people Jesus healed were lepers. Isn't that awesome? And if leprosy has to do with the words out of our mouth, and she says, grab hold of a Bible verse, what's it asking you to do? Come to Jesus and say, forgive me. Forgive me, yep. build me up. I, I said wrong words, forgive them. Heal the leprosy that's in my life. That's what magnify means, that God, you are closer than I think in the middle of this. And the authority, people, hegeomai, the authority to do this. Uh, Heidi Baker, in the story that she said about Heidi Baker, she said, I forced myself walking through the midst of this disaster. I forced myself to focus on the Lord. I force myself. People, we got to force ourselves and this closeness. David cried, the Bible said, till we couldn't cry anymore. So I'm not telling you, man up on Mother's Day. <laughs> you know, <laughs> come on, be a man. Uh, that, that's not my passion today, you know, to do that. and Don't be weak. He cried till he couldn't cry anymore. So that happens. That's the reality of life. But you can't live there. Okay, you can't live there. And Jenny talked about other voices around us that are talking. Look what David did. It said he called Abiathar, the priest, and said, start to play worship music. I need to hear from God. So you cry till you can cry anymore, but then you got to stop, take authority, move your emotions in the right ledger. I'm not going to live here. I'm not going to live with a burnt down town. I'm going to move on from this and hear from God. God, what do you want to do from this situation? Because guess what? His hands are not tied. Jenny just said that. He's not up there going, I tried to stop <laughs> Zigleg from being burned. What can I do? Sorry, David. Man up. That's not God. He's over all. 
God, what do I do now that this situation happened? Not what the situation, what do I do now that this situation happened? What do you want me to do? That's drowning out the voice. What voices were around him? 600 guys that want to kill him. How many think those are intimidating voices? I have got to drown out those voices and hear from God. God, what do you have? What Bible verse is there for me in this thing? So, God, would you speak to me? Yeah. I just came across this uh, short, very short. Um, I just want to read it to you. It's an illustration on an encouragement. As a group of frogs was traveling through the woods, two of them fell into a deep pit. When the other frogs crowded around the pit and saw how deep it was, they told the two frogs that there was no hope left for them. However, the two frogs decided to ignore what the others were saying, and they proceeded to try and jump out of the pit. Despite their efforts, the group of frogs at the top of the pit were still saying that they should just give up that they would never make it out. Eventually, one of the frogs took heed to what the others were saying, and he gave up, falling down to his death. The other frog continued to jump as hard as he could. Again, the crowd of frogs yelled at him to stop the pain and just die. He jumped even harder and finally made it out. When he got out, the other frog said, did you not hear us? The frog explained to him that he was deaf. He thought they were encouraging him the whole time. I love that. And that's awesome. <laughs> God, can you flip that around in our lives? You know what people are saying. Taking authority. People taking authority. Uh, the Bible says in Ephesians that I pray that your eyes would be opened up, that you know the power that's at work within you, the same power that raised Christ from the dead. So this is something that you have that we can take authority over. These situations happen, but we can take authority and pray with authority that's how you magnify the Lord. What does that look like? Uh, if the worship team could come back up, because we're going to pray this through. Pray for joy. Pray for joy. Proverbs 10, 28. Pray for joy. Just begin to ask that. God, not just, give me joy, I'm dying here. No, with authority. God, you promised me joy. You promise me. Look what it says. He gives us songs in the middle of the night. People, we wake up in the middle of the night tossing and turning, trying to figure out how we're going to get through this situation. What does God promise? There's going to be a song in the middle of the night. That you're going to wake up singing praises. Can you imagine that? That is a promise. That's what's claiming authority is. Uh, Nehemiah 8.10. Uh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. This is how David's doing it. God, you are my strength. You are my joy. You are my hope. You are it. You're it. Everything's gone, but you are it. Uh, C.S. Lewis said this, hardships often prepare ordinary people for extraordinary destiny. Now, I'm not trying to put words in God's mouth, but I could see where David would have been very satisfied with Ziklag the rest of his life. And a king saying, you're like an angel. God had more than that for his life. What did he have? I want you to rule a whole nation, not a city. And so this problem, it was destroyed, and God moved him to something greater. Right after this story, immediately Immediately after this story, the next event that happens in David's life is he becomes king of Judah. Is that not incredible? That God used that. He could have sat in Ziklag crying, whining, woe is me, until everybody stoned him. David encouraged himself in the Lord, heard from God, and this is why it's so important, people, it's more than just about us. You know what David did? He went to his men. And said, we're going to reclaim everything that's lost. Now they then say they're going to rebuild Ziklag. That was gone. People, sometimes things are beyond hope. But what's really important is still there. He got back his wives, his children, the money, everything, and more. And then those guys that were talking about stoning him, guess what? They become his mighty warriors. Some of them take on giants. Some of them, one guy kills 600 people all by himself. The guys that were discouraged and going to stone him saw a man that said, I know how to magnify the Lord. Guys, I heard from God. We're reclaiming everything that's lost. That's my inheritance from God. That what Satan tried to steal from me, that's my inheritance. You mothers that are praying, oh, come on. For someone that's lost, it's your inheritance in the Lord. God, this is my inheritance. Like Noah was a righteous man and God spared his whole family, claim your inheritance. I am a righteous person. I claim my family for you. It is my inheritance as a child of God. Begin to take authority that God do. There's going to be times that you cry until you can cry no more. But then there's times you rise up and say, I'm done crying. Now starts the battle. Satan, this is what you've done. But now, my God, but God. 
but God. There we begin. People, this is why we need to learn to encourage ourselves in the Lord. Christine Kane says, sometimes when you're, de- when you're in a dark place, you think you've been buried, but actually you've been planted. David looked like he was overwhelmed and buried, but how many know a king sprouted up out of that? A king sprouted up. Oh, people, we're children of God. Kings, queens, princesses, princes, children of God Almighty. Getting swallowed up here, God. No, you're being planted. You're being planted. There's some yogurt bar somewhere. It's either in the hallway or downstairs. We want you to grab some of that before you go. Get a picture. But I want to pray over you. I want you to stand with me. This is what we're going to do. We have other stuff going on. and There's feasts and festivals and food and whatever, but we're going to pray. Here's what I want you to do. We're going to worship the Lord just for a moment. I want every single woman to come up. I don't care if you're two or 102. I want you to come up, and we're just going to feel here. We're going to pray that God gives you open eyes to know that you have authority. You have authority, and you can move these things into a ledger, that there is power and authority, whatever the battle, whatever the battle. And it's not just about you. It's about those around you that need to see somebody that knows that Christianity is real. Come on up. Thank you for coming. Stand right here. Let's worship as they're coming, and then I'm going to have my wife pray over you in just a moment.